Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is American Issues Take Two. And we're talking today about climate change, more specifically uh, about the, <clears throat> the, the elephant, the elephant in the room. It's still climate change. Um, maybe, maybe the crisis about climate change will just go away miraculously all by itself. That's not likely. And we're going to handle that against the background of what's going on, you know, in, in other areas, in, in politics, for example, in war, for example, and in distractions around the world. We'll be back in a moment. This discussion, uh, we have Stephanie Stoll Dalton, our regular contributor, and uh, Vicky Caetano, our regular esteemed guest. Welcome to the show, ladies. Hello. So, you know, here we are talking every day about so many, you know, raw meat issues, if you will, um, especially domestic issues, but there are international issues that are just as important. What we really don't talk about uh, except in maybe the, in the myopic context of the weather, um, is climate change. And we see the floods and we see the droughts and we see the, you know, the extreme weather and phenomena all over the place, increasingly in this country, affecting you know, lives, properties, businesses, and ultimately the economy. But we don't really say that. We have the, um, we have the newscaster, holding the mic in front of a, a storm or a flood or a drought. And um, the climate change piece doesn't come up. Uh, the, the media is really not connecting the dots or calling for action. And so, Stephanie, let me go to you first. You know, wh what does this reflect? Why is this not important? You know, at the School of Journalism at, at UH, uh, they are famous for saying, the one most important story in our lifetimes, all of us, is climate change. And yet, it's not being reported. It, it is an irony, isn't it? Since the person standing out there in the wind and whatever, rain, snow, is only out there probably because climate change is occurring and we're, we're um, a degree um, we're a degree warmer. We're, we're two degrees warmer, I believe, than um uh, -huh, uh you know 50 80 years ago so so it is that is a very good question jay and it may be this pro parochialism right that so people want to hear about what's going on in their world nearby in the neighborhood um but it is an opportunity to remind um folk of um get getting uh, um as much control as we can have over the climate which means um taking care of some of our our carbon emissions and thinking more seriously about uh, of the efforts that are being made i'm 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 sure that that could be worked in if somebody in the policy uh department of our media you know would promote you know connecting to the bigger the bigger issue it's a good time to remind people you don't want to have this kind of destruction and damage and discomfort uh, from the storm um there there's a way we can reduce it they why need why vicky why do the, does the press not connect it uh why do we do raw meat in washington in the beltway and trump and congress and you know the gop um uh, and and in alternative measures uh a focus on uh, you know Europe and Ukraine and Putin and all this and 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 further alternative to Xi Jinping in China and the possibility of war in Taiwan. All of those are so sexy, so raw meat, uh, laced with the possibility of violence. Um, but we don't talk about climate change. Why is it that we put the priorities wrong this way? Well, you know, Jay, I think like Stephanie said, you know, there's a lot of distraction going on. And I think that uh, one of the problems for us when you talk about the media is that there is a segment of our media that's owned and controlled by people who don't want to connect the dots or who don't believe that you can connect climate change to what's happening with what we've experienced in the last few years. Um, and so, you know, media has now become not so much about journalism, like what you folks do on Think Tech, but it's more about uh, the money. It's a business and what sells. And I think they're very hesitant to uh, offend or reluctant to offend a part of their uh, business line that, that would 
be impacted negatively in a financial way if they connected the dots. And that's why you're, you're not hearing them talk about it or connecting the dots to what's happening to us with uh, the failure in our country to address climate change. With that said, it's not so easy either, you know. Um, and while corporations have been pushing uh, on that in that direction, when you think about Hawaii's plan, for example, that in 2045 we will be achieving 100% clean energy. Excellent goal. How are we going to do that? What happens to all of the automobile, the vehicles that we have that are not going to be on this energy? Do we have all the elect the uh, outlets where we can plug in electrical vehicles, apartments, you know, think about how to execute that. So to the state's credit, they, they put they talk about this and they're going to put money on it, but the plan to execute is very challenging. But we have to start doing that. You know, you alluded to the the fact that um some people in the public public conversation don't want to talk about it. And indeed, you know, uh, an oil company might might be motivated not to talk about it. And and a media supported by an oil company might be motivated not to cover it. Um, but, you know, in the Trump years, we learned that bloody everything can be politicized. I mean, medicine, vaccines can be politicized. School books can be politicized. And on and on, we could spend the whole show here talking about all the things that have become irrationally politicized. But don't you think, Vicky, that climate change has also been politicized? Uh, aside from corporations that have a clear vested interest in avoiding the issue, there are a lot of people that feel like denying the vote. They deny that climate change is happening. Absolutely. I'm sorry to say, but everything has been politicized, as we have seen. Uh, and it's also created now the inability for us as a people to come together. And this is one of the biggest challenges because you want to solve big problems, big issues. Uh, you've got to come together and find those solutions. The other thing is we talk so much about it that I think it falls on deaf ears and the next generation talks about it some more. Uh, think about if we put some action into the, to this instead of just, you know, verbalizing the concern. We have got to put in to place action. Uh, in Hawaii, to me, one of the things we have to start doing is taking a serious look at this plan in 2045. That is around right around the corner. How are we gonna achieve that? If we don't start making headway now, the reality is we're gonna start pushing back again and realizing that that's not a possibility. Yeah. You know, um... Uh, Stephanie, you know, it strikes me that um, we we have we 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 the older people uh, look to the younger people uh, to be conscious on this issue. Uh, you know, why don't we call it a woke on this issue? <laughs> and um, my question to you is: Are the young people awoke on this issue? Do they take the mantle of responsibility um, to go and lobby and make a plan, what, whatever? You know, and 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 uh, you know, do do uh, clean energy and all the things you would want to do um, to deal with climate change, to ameliorate climate change. But but are they doing that? And if they're not doing that, what's missing? What's missing in in the world of that you know upcoming generation? Uh, uh, you know that could make them more conscious of this issue. Well, the last day the the. The, the issue to shore does not seem to be um, climate among the young, except among selected groups. And of course, we have internationally young people working on it with Greta Thornburg. Um, I don't know, she's controversial lately. But um, in, in Hawaii, um, that 2045 uh, goal is laudable. And actually, it's, it's Honeywell is the big corporation behind that, which is really interesting. Um, but I think that uh, California has stepped up and Gavin Newsom has promoted uh, actually a first world plan for um, achieving carbon neutrality by 2045. So uh, there's a lot written up on this um, in order to cut the air pollution, reduce the greenhouse gas and 
um, you know, make sure that uh, the fossil fuels industry has, uh, you know, been reduced considerably uh, to uh, maybe like one tenth of what it does for us now. And of course, the benefit would be that um, that and that would create millions of jobs, like four million jobs or something that's predicted. So in, in California, I mean, I would hope there's more um, commitment to it. I, I know that in seeing climate, this climate um, plan from Ca Gavin Newsom that's highly touted as the first really world plan to get to carbon neutrality is not accompanied by mention of Hawaii, who also has a 2045 plan that Vicki just talked about. So I think that um, that publicity is a little low on this as well as perhaps the the action. I, I do know there's been a push, and you all probably heard it too, that hasn't gone over so well, but they're trying to make the point that gas, natural gas is fossil fuel. And it seems to me there may be a confusion about where natural gas is coming from. And uh, I, it looks like maybe there's an effort um, to, to educate people about that that, that is not a choice away from electricity that is away from fossil fuel. So there, there's lots of work to be done, many ways to come about doing that that should be very interesting to the youth of today. Who are no, I, well, I think the natural gas interests have been educating people to think that natural gas is a, quote, bridge fuel, remember that term? Uh, <clears throat> and it's okay. And, and, and a lot of people walk around with that notion, it's okay because it's a bridge fuel. In fact, it's fossil fuel. You're right. And Jay, yeah. and Jay, the, the horror of gas is it's frack the fracking. That so too. actually, yeah. actually, when you go a step further into it, it's really, really very unattractive and mm -hmm. and uh, um a death now for um for the earth in, in additional ways than just too much carbon. So Vicky, let's talk about the money for a minute, you know. Uh, my wife and I went to Reykjavik, Iceland a few years ago. And, uh, you know, they used to have uh, glaciers and snow-covered vistas. Used to be really beautiful, cold, northern, you know, uh, kind of Scandinavian environment, but further north. Um, <clears throat> but when we went, we found that there were no glaciers to speak of. Um, the, the snow and ice had receded. Temperature had improved. Um, and, you know, I kept asking the tour guides, you know, what happened? I thought you guys were, you know, concerned about that. <clears throat> well, the fact is, there's a lot of people visit Iceland and they don't want to stress the notion, um, you know, that, that they're no longer the old Iceland that we thought, uh, you know, was, was an example of how to deal with climate change. And um, I, I think, you know, that's in their own self-interest, isn't it? And so it's no longer a priority, at least not in the conversation they have with tourists. And, and I suggest to you that even in Europe, you know, where, where they try to raise money, money is so important. We talked about that a minute ago. Um, the, the European countries, the EU, the NATO countries, uh, they're, they're busy thinking about, you know, Ukraine and Russia and the future of the liberal world order, which is very important for sure. But they're giving their money to Ukraine, not to climate change. And it is absolutely, you know, pathetic how little money they and and we give to climate change. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that um, you have to follow the money, um, and because the money is a metric of the level of interest that we have, uh, not only here but everywhere in the world. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up, Jay. That's absolutely right. Follow the money. Isn't it ironic if you think about it? One of the most impactful things to climate change is all this traveling. And here we are in Hawaii, the most remote location for people to come. You know, they've got to travel a long distance. And so we're talking about assessing visitors a fee. But the fact that they have to travel this distance is one of the biggest impacts to climate change, to the fact that they have to come here or for us to travel there. Think of what that does to the economy. So follow the money. But I think it's very ironic we talk about it we don't talk about the elephant in the room, which is coming to Hawaii. That in itself is one of the things you should be looking at, or for us going to the mainland. You know, there was a piece on 60 Minutes only a few days ago about fusion energy. And in fact, uh, you know, the print press has covered that 
you know, a number of times in the past couple of weeks. Um, you know, the discovery in Lawrence Livermore about the, you know, actual fusion where you, you put so much energy in and you get energy plus back. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, it's, it's enough to uh, heat a, 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 a kettle of tea right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the dream is that soon enough we'll have fusion energy that will light the world. And for that matter, fly those planes you're talking about. However, you know, the issue, and this is really important, is you got some people say, oh, yeah, we're going to do that in five years. Sure we are. We've been studying fusion for 50 years. Uh, and others are saying, well, you know, how about, how about 2050, 2060 before it becomes a reality? You know, what I get out of this, Vicky, is that um, we are confused about the timeline. Uh, the 2045 clean energy timeline was let's throw it on the wall and see if it sticks kind of timeline. There was no science behind that at all. Um, so query, you know, here we have fusion, which is, you know, the, would be the great Mahaya that we could have fusion energy and do all this stuff without having a, a negative effect on, on climate. But we don't know when. And um, although we're putting some money into it, maybe a lot of money into it, nobody can tell us it's going to happen soon enough. So we're in a race against time. Don't you agree? That's right. And, you know, uh, time is, is the most valuable thing that we have and too little, too late. And uh, sometimes I wonder if these things are being touted to, to just kind of pacify people to buy more time. But we've run out of time already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in the... What was his name? Al Gore made that movie Inconvenient Truth back in the 90s. Sure. I got to tell you, I was, I was at a dinner party and somebody told me the movie was playing around the corner at the Varsity Theater. And I stood up and I left the meeting. I left the dinner. I said, I had to see the movie Goodbye, Everybody, because I realized that this was the biggest story of our lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody else stood up, just me. What I'm saying is that that was a big story in the 1990s. Is it, as, is it as big a story now or is it maybe a, a smaller story? You know, and, and Stephanie, I, I went to see um, a play at St. Anthony's. Uh, Hank Rogers and a Blue Planet funded this play. And it was about clean energy and climate change, among other things, in the future. You know, and it's, it was it was for the six year olds. And they loved it. And they walked out singing the songs and chanting, you know, the slogans that the play taught them. And I said, my goodness gracious, this is really a statement of affecting the next generation. But I haven't seen that play later. And I haven't seen a whole lot later. And I think that our level of education for that generation we talked about is actually on the decline. Um, you know, think about all the, the trouble in Washington, the trouble in the schools, the trouble in the libraries, um, the you know, critical race theory kind of perversion of our education for these kids. Um, we're, we're the same priority problem that exists globally exists in the schools and it exists in, in the, the, the hallowed halls of Congress where they're supposed to be making public policy. Uh, what happened? Um, why aren't these kids and others um, forcing Congress to do something? Well, that's such oh, that's the question, right? And before we get into that, the Congress, I wanted to share my my astonishment uh, that would be very attractive for schools to take on. Um, is that uh, if all of the moo cows, um, the cattle were controlled better, um, fed different things, uh, and had their methane production reduced, that it equals what we could get out of changing over to electric cars. Now, I, I'm sure um, that, I mean, I can't give you a citation or uh, an actual scientific number, but it, it was from a credible source. And I found that uh, astonishing that that we have something that uh, we are perfectly um, able able to uh, address and at least take care of something that would make a pretty immediate difference and uh, give us some momentum on it. Um, and that's uh, that that is something that would be a great theme for all of our schools and for youngsters to learn so much about our relationship uh, 
uh, with the animal kingdom and how the animal kingdom can do just things that have the same unfortunate impact as human uh, behavior. But um, yeah, so then going over to the Congress, I'll let you take that away because I, we're right up against it. I, why everybody wants to continue to be a coal miner or wants to support, you know, what better elevators to take more people down into larger shafts to get to the coal? Why Why are we investing, uh, you know, um, in, in that and being um, pursued and tormented to be careful about reducing um, our our coal mining. I, I'm, so maybe that that's something to talk about. I mean, I understand that uh, the coal mining is, uh, you know, traditional and um, cultural, but it it it's what has has in the past ruined London and is now about ready to ruin the rest of the world. You know, Vicky, we've talked about the United Nations many times as the you know de facto single global leadership organization. Uh, we've criticized them um, because they have this problem in the Security Council with the veto um, by you know the worst of our member nations, um, and and so you wait for the United Nations to do something dispositive, but they haven't, and they can't. They can't raise the money, and they can't come up with the you referred to it, the P L A N. Um, so if I give you a clean energy by 2045, aspirational in Hawaii and elsewhere, um, is that a plan? Um, how do you make a global plan for a global problem? Uh, it, it, Gavin Newsom operating in California, is that a global plan? Uh, you know, they say, oh, politics is local. What about all climate change? Is that local too? Um, don't we have to have a global plan? Where is that going to come from? And this is the hard question I saved for you, Vicky. What does that plan look like? You know, I, I think when while you talk about a global plan, I, I think that that's going to be extremely challenging because most countries are going to say, look in your own backyard and do what you need to do. And this, to me, is the ironic thing that <clears throat> we recognize in Hawaii, how important climate change is. I don't think if you talk to most people in Hawaii anyway, nobody disagrees with that. And yet we're talking about building more buildings, more residents, more hotels at the same time, because nobody wants to talk about reducing visitors, follow the money. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about all these ideas, but we're not willing to really move the difficult issues forward that we know we have to do. Mm -hmm. That what may be the honest it, statement. What so, would it take, Vicki? You know, uh, th there's a storm out there with our name on it. You know, like some of the really destructive storms that we have seen over the past few decades. There's one coming and it is going to be a whopper and it is going to hit, you know, Honolulu, for example. Yeah. And uh, just because you live on a hill or I live on a hill doesn't save us because the society will collapse down along the water in terms of following the money for the hotels, the economy, all the services you know, and goods um, that, that we rely on. And so if there's a storm hits, for example, Honolulu and stops our society, um, nobody is exempt, nobody is saved. We are all directly affected. So I give you two thoughts about that. Um, you know, one is um, uh, it, uh, when that happens, we are gonna get the message. I promise you, we are, we are going to get the message writ large when, when the, you know, the whole Hawaii just stops um, and there's tragedy in every corner. That's one aspect of it. The other is it doesn't take, um, you know, a, a whole lot of political uh, savvy to realize this is coming uh, and to become not only sustainable, but um, resilient so that we can recover after it happens. And I... I actually don't see a plan on either the sustainability, a com, you know, a, a comprehensive plan on sustainability or on resilience. Mm -hmm. um, what will it take? Well, Jay, can I sim submit one uh, real terrorizing um, fact? Um, and I've had some interest in windows on the condominiums over the last couple of years. And as I understand it, our windows in all of these condominiums that are more and more completely glass um, are only able to withstand a category three. 
So if, as you say, something like a fiver or close to it hits um, Honolulu, we will be so devastated. I, I, I can't even imagine recovering uh, within any reasonable amount of time. We'll be more in um, a devastation and needing uh, FEMA and aid and um, de- just desperation. So it's such a good point that you raise. And why is it that we don't have windows that are capable of surviving that 100-year storm that's coming here like it comes everywhere, i.e. Sandy in New Jersey? But um, also the corporations are behind this and we don't, you know, we talk about the Congress and our uh, Congress people who are are not diligent on it. But uh, Howard Hughes is, you know, I think he's on his seventh condominium now going up here. Exactly. As you say, coming in and sucking up all this additional electricity. And um, I, I this is this is another question. What's their role and how can government partner better with corporations and especially here we, we, we will suffer from this and maybe lose it for who knows how long if we got hit with a storm like that there'd be nothing going on. i'm gonna speak about covid i think this could be much worse than that so vicky let me deflect that question to you what's the role of you know the developers what's the role of the, the corporate community what's the role of the Oh, gee whiz, uh, the NGOs, the um, the nonprofits, what, what's the role of the average citizen? What's the role of the government? What's the role of the executive uh, people in the government, the legislature? What's the role of the courts? Ha- and how do, you, how do you get them to play that role? No, exactly, Jay. You know, to really make an impact. Well, Hawaii is so small. Okay, in fairness, and one of the things we always say is that what we emit doesn't have the kind of global impact that a California, the United States, other parts of the world do. But with that said, everybody does have a responsibility to play a role in this. And we need to create those plans in order to mitigate the impact of climate change on us, as we've been seeing already. But I think when you say follow the money, this is one of the challenges between the unions and corporations. Nobody is willing to pay that big price that uh, is necessary to be part of having a bigger plan. So, you know, we'll throw money here and there, 100 million, 50 million. Uh, I think leadership is just praying that something major doesn't happen on our watch. kick the can down the road, shall we say, and let the next generation deal with it. I think in all honesty, that is truly the plan. And for now, we do small bits and pieces here. Like I said, I applaud the uh, plan for the 2045 uh, to alternative energy completely, 100% clean energy. But I'd really like to see executing that plan uh, because all I see is 10 years from there saying we need another 25 years to do this plan. Mm-hmm. So it sounds good, but if you stop and think, while we're talking about that, as Stephanie pointed out, we're building more buildings in, in Kaka'ako, more hotels coming up, uh, visitors are still coming. And th- that really is the impact of climate change, if you think of what Hawaii could do. But there's a huge price associated with that. Yes, absolutely. And we have, we have to have the reserves to pay that price. And every time we develop a surplus, we give it away. Um, you know, like in uh, payments of hundreds of dollars to each taxpayer. I say, you know, one of the things under consideration is a $300 payment to every taxpayer. So what, what is that about? So couldn't we use that on some common benefit, common goal, common plan, like climate change. And so at the end of the day, we don't have a reserve for this. And at the end of the day, we don't spend the money for this to harden ourselves. Uh, and, and, and this is interesting. There's a dynamic here. Let me go back into history. You know, um, back in the day, uh, that is after Al Gore and the movie, in the, in the aught years, there was so much conversation in Hawaii about climate change. Now there isn't. And, and uh, there was you know, all this talk about having the money, worrying about the extreme weather, all that. Now there really isn't. And I, th- I take your point, Vicky. I think what's happening is that our, our, our officials, 
are saying, well, you know, if we have extreme weather, we're really going to be in for it. And and if we're in for it, um, uh, everybody's going to leave town and there's going to be nothing left here. Uh, so uh, let's just rely on good old fashioned luck. That's what I, I agree with you. It'll be too late to do anything. And say, I got to go now. Bye. You know? <laughs> but, you know, the, the fact is that uh, Hawaii could distinguish itself. Don't you think, Stephanie? We could take our own advice. Uh, we could be more sustainable, more resilient. Um, we could deal with this. We could have a reserve. We could create a fund. Uh, we could, you know, change our building codes and the like. Um, to be better prepared for that weather. And we can survive that way. Uh, I, I, sorry. No, I was going to say, like, while we want to continue having visitors come, because that is the heart of our, you know, for our state's economy, but why not take a look at the visitor impact? Uh, to our state? Why not have hotels uh, monitor the utilization of energy that guests use? Why not make them a partner versus just giving them free reign on how they consume energy? So there's ways that we can, you know, we can't cross that bridge overnight, but we got to start implementing some of these things in order to counter the impact of climate change. I would like to say that if there are any aspiring uh, executive uh, politicians um, for those who's out there who might want to be a leader in Hawaii, this is a really important topic, which we're we're going to be facing up to sooner than we probably want to. So um, what uh, it would be interesting to hear from people about what would be a plan for making these changes uh, from someone interested in doing that at the highest level um, as governor or or Lieutenant Governor. So there we have some really good questions and some momentum here on getting at that topic and getting it discussed in the ways that there can maybe be a difference made, because I don't see it happening now. There's a problem with the democracy because, you know, the public officials respond to the lobbyists, they respond to their constituents, um, and but they don't look over the horizon. They don't, they don't make plans for things that are obvious. And, and, and so the science that tells us um, that the sea level will rise, the science that tells us that our weather will, you know, de, you know destroy a good part of our, uh, is likely to destroy a good part of our economy, um, th that's, that's just not, nobody is advocating, you know, that's the problem. You know, you guys, I was uh, looking at some of our old shows back in 2013, 2014, and I had a very interesting show. Um, about climate change. We called it, uh, I forget what we called it, but, um, and one of the points that came up was why don't we have more young developers out of school? Developers take risks anyway. Uh, and we have to teach those kids out of school that taking risks, are, that's okay. It's okay in business. Uh, it's okay in entrepreneurship and, and uh, you know, technology development and all that to be okay in developing properties. And they are the ones who presumably understand that they have a leg up, they have a, a, an interest in this. And because uh, it's gonna be their state soon enough. Uh, and if we had more young developers who were awake on climate change, maybe the developments would be different, maybe more like the kind uh, that Stephanie talks about. But if you were looking for a comprehensive plan, Vicky, that an executive official of the state might adopt and run with and take a risk, a political risk with, and dedicate some money and time and attention and, and twist some arms about, what would it look like? Well, I think that uh, there is a plan out there. And I think what everyone should be looking at is what it would take for them and it, as part of the community to execute that plan. So in our business world, for example, we have a lot of transportation vehicles. How are we gonna manage that? And the state should be a partner in that. Do you expect a business to convert fully to uh, you know, alternative energy? Is there some kind of incentive? Because it's a huge price tag to do that. How about small business? How do they play a role? So I think every business as a start should put down, this is the plan, how are you gonna be able to achieve it? It's all these pieces that we have to connect together in order to achieve that goal. 
That takes leadership, doesn't it? Yeah. And it takes priority. And 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 part of <laughs> it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but part of leadership is priority. Yeah. And the will to do it. <laughs> well, Stephanie, if we do nothing, this is the Charles Dickens uh, approach, and we look at the the ghost of Christmas future, and we keep on you know plunging down the road without um, calling for people to perform their roles and get on board uh, to, uh, you know, act on a plan. What happens to Hawaii? Well, I think that Hawaii's loss would be a detriment, would be uh, suffered by everybody on the planet, in addition to just generally being sorry to have anybody. Well, you're it. right. I want to make that distinction. You know, there's the extreme weather, there's the sea level rise that would definitely affect us. Yeah. But there's also, you know, the notion of... Um, too much rain in one place, too little rain in the other place, drought, um, you know, uh, sort of um, ubiquitous things that affect the whole planet. And we have to make a distinction. I mean, if we if we all get in electric cars, um, that is not going to do that much for Hawaii specifically, but yeah. it will help climate change around the world. So you have to make that distinction, don't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't want to have Hawaii be just the tip of Mount Kea with the telescopes up there, which would leave it, you know, as a very important point uh, on the globe. But uh, nobody, uh, um, everybody would be interested in this. And I mean, I mean, I am curious that Miami is already underwater. They're they're keeping a lot of stuff undercover there, but their flooding is just an, an enormous. Their their drains are not working uh, for getting things into the ocean. So we 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 it's all out there, about ready to pop. And it may be that it the signs and the and the dangers that we're already in are, are going to pop and get people to get a little bit smarter about this. But it does take, as you say, that whole, the, all the communities have to be involved in this, especially the scientists and the UH and the universities. And how are we going to make all of this come uh, together in, in a database, in a scientifically uh, based uh, manner that uh, not only can all, uh, corporate areas and other areas of commerce help with this small business, but also even the military. I mean, they're in jeopardy here too. If they lose their Kaneohe Bay and Pearl Harbor resources and have everything dry dock flooded all the time, that's not going to work either. So, I mean, it, it's not anything to be ignored, but we are ignoring it, but it, but it'll get to the point where it won't be ignorable anymore. Maybe we have to go there. Before. Yeah, one of the points you made is that it, it seems to be accelerating. Every time yes. you look, you see a story in the in the press that um, you know it's happening faster than we thought. Um, th this is very very troubling. Yeah. So, Vicky, let me let me put the, uh, the the Dickens question to you. <laughs> we talk about following the money. We talk about the hotels and the uh, you know the Hawaii mono economy. Uh, if we have uh, sea level rise, if we have climate change, if we have a problem with tourists coming here. Uh, hotels operating here because nobody thought about a way to deal with this. What happens to Hawaii? Um, and what would we do then? And what would be the effect? So I think that if we just carry on as we're doing, making small kind changes, as we say, we're already seeing what the future is going to be, except it will be exacerbated. The problem will be even bigger. Uh, and the big uh, tsunami that comes is going to create such tremendous damage. Um, that is what's going to happen. I think people don't have the kind of timeline that you see, and that's why it continues to move along so slowly. They think, oh, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. But if we make this difficult change, it's going to impact how I live, impact jobs. We have to change, look at other industries. It's a big undertaking, and it does need leadership to bring people together and to connect all the dots. The easier way is to just hobble along as we are, and uh, whether it's in 10 years or 30 years, uh, we're going to see the problems we're experiencing on a much bigger scale and more frequent. And I think that many people are, frankly, opting to do that and just buy time. Take a chance. Rely on old-fashioned luck. Hope that storm passes us by all the, you know, yeah. 
And then, of course, we have, you know, a, a, we can't disconnect this from the fact that Congress doesn't care. You think Marjorie Taylor Greene be believes in this discussion. You think that for one minute she cares about climate change. For her, it's, um, you know, it's a matter of being uninformed and, and stupid uh, and, um, and, and, and politicized for her own self-interest. So Congress, you can't count on Congress to do anything. And I think that's one of the lessons I take away. And I'd like to know here in the last moments of our show how you feel about that. Um, can we, I mean, Joe Biden is trying, he's trying, <clears throat> but it, query, is it enough? And with a dysfunctional Congress uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, can we act at the national level? And if we, if we cannot act at the national level for any number of reasons, um, can Hawaii do enough to protect itself on both of those areas of exposure? That is how climate change would affect us and how the world's response, the world's um, you know, succumb, succumbing to climate change uh, would affect us uh, so overall. Um, so anyway, we're, we're out of time almost, and I'd like to ask you to make uh, final comments. Stephanie, you first. I think we have to, want to hear more from our leaders, our reps. Uh, there are 210 uh, or something people in the House that we're not hearing it from at all. So uh, I think uh, we are in good leadership position with uh, President Biden and we'll keep on going here. Uh, uh, but you're right, the political situation is dire. That needs to be um, jerked up into action and hopefully it will be uh, by by the ideas and the, and the, um, and the interventions uh, more than by the next catastrophe we have in Hawaii or, or hopefully not uh, in Miami, in Miami and hopefully not in Hawaii. <laughs> Let's let the, the, uh, the, the mainland um, areas that are impacted by this are in much better position to, um, to, to work uh, on improving them before we have to face uh, even more um, effect of it. Uh, but a good point you make is that if the mainland, if the United States economy suffers, and ultimately it will <clears throat> for the lack of action, that will have an effect on Hawaii right there. It would make it easier for Hawaii to, you know, do yeah. it. Absolutely. So, so your final comments, Vicki, what, what would you offer our, our viewers uh, to carry away from this? Uh, when they wake up tomorrow morning, what they should what should they be doing? You know, I think that while there are many voices, we need leadership to bring people together. And I would propose that even if we're not able to make big changes, getting everyone together to make the kind of changes they need in their household, in their neighborhood, in their business, make some kind of progress is better than nothing. And it, it is that action together that will bring people to connect the dots so that we can make the bigger, you know, take the, be willing to make the bigger compromises that ultimately lead us. So more, you know, smaller steps is sometimes necessary in order to achieve the big success. Uh, and I think everybody has to try just, you know, a, a, uh, a collaborative a trial, a try, a collaborative attempt. A collaborative effort would be the best we can do. Let's a do joint that. one. Yeah, yes, yeah. joint. Thank you both. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Thank you, Vicky Cantano. So enjoy these discussions. Sure. All the best to you guys. Thanks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.